Focus Now is a 24 hour non-stop global platform for world leaders and stakeholders globally to come together to discuss India's development. It features Nobel laureates, lawmakers, civil society leaders, academics. So we're in very good company and is presented in partnership with the Rockefeller Foundation and the Skoll Foundation. As Rima mentioned, I'm Zoe Tabri. I'm the Land and Property Rights Editor at the Thomson Reuters Foundation, which is the charitable arm of Thomson Reuters. And I'm delighted to be your host today. I'm also thrilled to be joined by the renowned Peruvian economist, Hernando de Soto, and we'll be having a conversation with him about foundational systems for inclusive development. And by that, we mean equitable access to land and natural resources as a foundation for inclusive development, looking at experiences from around the world and how these apply to India's development agenda. Mr. De Soto is currently president of the Institute for Liberty and Democracy, which is headquartered in Lima in Peru, which is considered by The Economist magazine as one of the two most important think tanks in the world. He served as an economist for the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, as CEO of Universal Engineering Corporation, which is continental Europe's largest consulting engineering firm, and as a governor of Peru's Central Reserve Bank, among other roles. Um, Hernando, I was just about halfway through through the introduction, um, introducing you, in fact, so I'll just pick up midway if that's okay with you before we, we kick off our conversation. Um, I was just saying for, for those who picked up before the, the video that in the early 1990s, um, Mr. De Soto led the effort to insert Peru into the global economy and with his team at the Inter Institute for Liberty and Democracy, drafted and promoted more than 187 laws that gave the poorest Peruvians access to economic opportunities, including title to their property and businesses, and also created the National Office of Ombudsman to defend the constitutional and human rights of the Peruvian people. Bilance has considered him one of the world's most important 13 economists, Time Magazine, one of the five leading innovators of the century and among the 100 most influential people in the world. The Economist Magazine considered him the most innovative social scientist in 2005, and I could go on for a long time with about 30 other international prizes. As Rima mentioned at the start, I'll be interviewing Mr. Soto for about 30 minutes or so before we take questions from the audience which should take us to just about an hour. As a reminder, if you do have a question, please type it in the chat box you see at the bottom of your screen, and I'll then fill those to Mr. DeSoto so we don't have to go through the all too familiar pains of people muting and unmuting themselves. If you'd like to tweet, please feel free to do, do so using the hashtag the nudge forum. Now, without further ado, Professor DeSoto, thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's a huge pleasure to be here with you. And let's get straight to it. You've written extensively about how property rights for the world's poor could unlock trillions in, I quote, dead capital, and how the millions who do not have full rights to the property they live in and the land they farm are unable to leverage their resources to create wealth and their assets become dead capital, which cannot be used to generate income or growth. Before we go on to talk about legally protected property rights, to set the scene, could you first talk a little bit about through what the informal economy is, what it contributes to the global economy, and crucially, how the coronavirus pandemic has affected it. Right, it's a big word, informality. It says many things. It says to those who live in law and order that it's the part of society that cannot get organized. In Peru, it means mainly indigenous people of darker skin. In other words, places it's small enterprise, in other, in other places, it is uh, uh, those that have risen against the system, but I'll, it basically, it's a mirror reflection of formal society, normal society, like in New York, except that they're poor. They do the same things. They've got bakeries, they manufacture. As a matter of fact, even in India, they manufacture the car. It's like a bus on wooden planks. So they do the same thing at a smaller scale. So if you want to put all of these things into place, I think you have to actually not look at the past, but look at the, at the present and say, what is it today? Well, after the Industrial Revolution, it's that part of society that is willing to join the Industrial Revolution, that is to say large scale markets, all of that, but lacks the tools. Now, if you say how many tools there are, 
I would have to go through hundreds of tools. They don't have, they don't have access to limited liability. They don't have access to perpetual succession. They don't have access to identity systems that can cross across borders, all of these things. Now that list would take us a whole hour, but if we want to boil it down to just your question, it's at the end, those who cannot accumulate capital. What's capital? It means that the things that you have can gain value because they are safeguarded against various risks that apply to all stakeholders in such a way that when you say, I am John and I'm here and I pay my debts and I want credit because credit is nothing else than people believing that you in the future can do something with your university degree, with your artisanal degree, with what you own, with what you have access to, with your good looks, whatever it is, that's capital. It's not money but you can put it down into a document which starts off with a property document, but that adds so many safeguards that even a banker can use it and against it issue money and give you a step into the future. So the informal economy to be succinct is those who have no capital or access to credit. There are a bunch of other things, but it's no capital and no access to credit. Thank you. And now you've raised a really interesting point in terms of accumulating capital. I I know you've written about how legally property rights are are the source of developed world prosperity and and the lack thereof is the reason why many nations remain mired in poverty. I know you've also written recently for, I believe it was the OECD summit on social inclusion and formality in, in coronavirus times about how governments from developing countries have been accumulating debt to make up for citizens lost income, but how accumulating capital instead has the potential to unlock more value. Could you explain that theory? Yes, of course. It's actually all throughout the 18th and 19th century, which is what the West forgets. You see, the West, what it has today, is based on everything that they had to cope with to do have an industrial revolution. That is to say, to get large-scale markets, be able to produce in series and bring costs down. And of course, once you do that, uh, you get what Marx called surplus value, or what Westerners, where capitalists call value added. In other words, there's a potential in everything that you've got that if combined with others gets value. If we look at just my iPhone, right? For somewhere I saw it, it's made out of about 1,800 pieces. And what Steve Jobs did is put 1,800 things together. And that includes uh, Peruvian rare earths, that includes Peruvian copper, that includes Peruvian lithium, all right. But if you try and just sell lithium on its own or the copper or whatever it's on its own, you cannot do what Steve Jobs do, does, which is bring in materials and natural resources from various parts and put it into one iPhone and try and sell lithium on its own. It's worth nothing. In other words, what's behind capital is the possibility of an entrepreneur, that's any one of us, to bring things together. Look around you, even in India, wherever you are, and try and see one thing that you've got that's only got one source. If you've got trees, it's only got wood. Or if you've got minerals, it's only got a mineral. And you'll see nothing. There, that doesn't exist. Everything is the result of a combination. Back in the, uh, back in, uh, the 19th century, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, a French uh, great uh, sociologist, said, you know, the United States is going to take off. And why? Because they have the mother of all knowledge, which is the ability to combine. Okay, the informal sector, because they are people that are only known in their locality and people defend them because that's their culture and don't connect, don't combine. And that's why they're poor. So we could add capital and credit are the result of being able to combine and and, com and they are combined, when you combine, you produce added value. And if you can capture that ad value added in a document, you've got capital. And when you've got capital, then you can get money. Money is after capital. Capital is value that is printed in a document that everybody believes in and that you trust. And so this reminds me actually that um, I believe you made a, a similar distinction in, um, in your book, The Mystery of, of Capital, where um, I think you said that in, in the US, the, the kind of world's largest economy, that the most important source of funds for a new business was a mortgage on an entrepreneur's home. And comparing that, for example, to 
small smallholder farmers in Haiti, um, where in contrast, they normally cannot leverage the value of their home or their land to create businesses because they lack secure property rights. Now, kind of going to what you were saying about leveraging that, that capital, where has that experience been successfully done? And I'm particularly interested here in, in what you've done in, in the Peruvian context. Well, the first place that the real successful countries are the developed countries of the world. Because in developed countries, you can get credit and you can get capital and you can form a company that can combine things literally the first day. In Peru, I'm going to use my country because I like to accumulate all my enemies in one geographical situation if possible. So I'm not going to refer to India, to any other country in the world. In Peru, if you want to form a company, you've got to queue up. You've got to find a lot of papers. The bribes are involved. This guy's got to stamp it. This other guy's got to stamp it. And then, uh, if you're lucky, you start forming the company which allows you to combine, right? In the United States, you fill in whatever forms the state requires, or you know that you fill them in, you file it in, and that day you start operating. Unless, of course, it's a hospital, unless it's a dug material, you start on the word go. That means that instead of using what in Latin is called ex ante procedures, which is you have to get my permission, you use ex post procedures, which means you know what the law is. You go ahead and file whatever you have to do under the law. Just submit it, put an envelope, get going. But if I catch you afterwards not complying with what the law requires, sustainable development, respect of women, whatever it is, okay, I'm going to hit you like a hammer. But I'm going to do it once you have proven yourself guilty. But I'm not going to stop you from taking the initiative. That's what's called a free market, being able to enter at your, own, at your own risk, like I repeat, provided it's not like buying guns or whatever it is. So the general idea is developed countries are our prime example. Don't look to a developing country for an example because it's like saying, what do you have to do to get rich and then you just show poor people? That's not gonna be convincing to anybody. And you can't do it in developing countries because many of the elites in developing countries are the result of having inherited over ages or through racial discrimination. So if you start saying, look, these are the rich people, they're successful, many of them aren't successful because they competed like in the West. They're successful because they inherited and they, they protect themselves by uh, tradition, which uh, uh, I forget what the, the British author was that we call tradition is a democracy of the dead, which is where the dead actually vote how you're gonna do things. So what we did in Peru is we've advanced in certain areas and so have many other developing countries, the Brazilians or whatever it is, but not enough. So, and also there, it's not, we, in many cases, we've actually, like in the case of Peru, we had the highest growth rates, but it's not enough to do just one thing. It's a little bit like the sewage system in any house. You can't just clean it once a day. You've got to flush every day. You've got to mm. flush everything. So the question is that the success are those people that have learned that you need continual feedback from society to know when it is that you've got to flush. And when your, your sewage system or your water system doesn't work, you got to change it because nothing is enduring unless you get feedback from people. So it goes very close to democracy. You need feedback to make sustainable reforms. So one of the problems we've had in Peru with this IN is that we've made reforms but we haven't sustained them. And we've lost whatever advantage we had over the rest of Latin America. We were growing at 9% at a certain time. And then everybody took it for granted. Everybody said it's because of the Peruvian people. They're very special. They got rhythm. They're good looking. Uh, they know how to live life. And it wasn't that. It was just that we freed up the market. Thank you. And, and kind of zoning out a little bit and going back to a global view, are there is there any kind of reliable global data on whether we can say whether property rights globally are receding or advancing? How, how much progress have we made or how far have we gone back? Well, the first thing to do, Zoe, is uh, look at property rights, not as just the title. That's the big monstrous lie. Property the chain of right, yeah. yeah, the title, no, the title is just the first stage of a property right. You know, the way the, uh, the British and Americans describe it is a property right is like a bundle of sticks. It depends what you can do. You know, one stick says that you can buy it. The other stick says that you can sell it, etc. 
Now, if you get a property right that the only thing that says is you can protect it, it's yours, okay? But you can't buy it, you can't sell it, you can't trade it, you can't use it as a credential, and you don't have all the functions, that property right remains what it is. It's just a system of protection, which is why in many cases that we go in Peru, you find out that wherever the poor are congregated, without even a property title, the rights are stronger because there's a solidarity among them and you can't touch them. While I may have a title in the good part of Peru, but I'm so divorced from the rest of my neighbors that that title is probably in terms of ownership less secure than the one in the shanty town. So the important thing is uh, the important thing to realize, I think, uh, uh, according to this, is that titling is not enough. Titling is the seed, because the seed is what locates you, identifies you, and third, indicates that you are in conformity with a law that is recognized everywhere and that that law is enforceable. It only does really three things. Every other stick, buy, sell, combine, do complex stuff that is useful for everybody is also a property right, but we tend to think of that like the financial market or globalization, but it is the completion of a property right. The problem is, you know, vocabulary. We're trapped in the vocabulary of thinking that a property right is all about just the boundaries. The boundaries are the starting point, but that's not enough. And could you put that, thank you, that's really useful. And, and could you put that a little bit in the context of that we face today of the coronavirus pandemic? I'm, I'm assuming that establishing um, these legally kind of secured land and property rights is as crucial as ever in a time where eviction moratoria are coming to an end, where indigenous people face ever increasing threats to their, their land. I mean, just the Global Witness report a few weeks ago was showing, um, I believe, record uh, violence against indigenous people since, since they started collecting the data. So how, how kind of important has that approach become in, in the time we face today? Well, the, what, we've, what we've seen here, you know, now with coronavirus, we're all empirical. It's a whole new ballgame. And so what we've been seeing here, let me give you the experience of Peru as we begin to learn what's happening in other countries and we can consolidate that knowledge. The informal economy uh, is the one that is by far the hardest hit. And it's by far the hardest hit uh, because uh, in the first place, uh, to know when people are confined so that there's no contagion and check, you got to know who owns what and who is where. And so if you don't know, who's got what and who owns what on a universal basis, you can't apply the law. If afterwards, when everybody, when according to the International Labor Organization, just in the first month, 60% of the informal economy, which is about 70% of the world's economy, it's that big, uh, 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 have lost about 60% of all their income and savings. They're being wiped out. And then when the governments come in and said, okay, we're going to use our reserves to help you and we're going to give you small credit so that you can surge along or so you can fight the sickness or whatever it is, you can't locate the informal sector because you don't have official addresses. It's very hard to do. I mean, you can be imaginative and then go door to door, which is something you can see. But if you think you're going to be able to use information technology to get to them, you're not because uh, you may know where things are, but you don't even know who lives in them. Mm. You take all the catastrophes and all the photographs you want of the city, you know where everything is, but the question is who's in there? And who do I address to them? And who do I make accountable? And then if you're in the more intellectual field, like say you and I are, well, you know, we can work telecommunications, but if you work with your hands, that's physical. If it involves doing that, whether you're a surgeon or you're in the informal economy, you need to have some other form of contact and there's no way of locating. So what we're now finding out is that this idea of saying that informality is an important criteria to, for economics to work and for law and order to work, we're finding out now that, I give you again, international labor organization figures, we're 7,500 million people in the world of which economically active population are 3,300 million. And of these 3,300 million, 2,000 million, that's to say 2 billion, are in the informal economy. Those are the ones that have lost 60% of their income and therefore all the other 
shall we say, ideologies or viewpoints that said the way to distribute society is this, that, and the other. You know, there's some things we can agree. There's men and there's women, sure. We can agree. There's gay rights, okay. We can divide that up and put in gay rights as well, fine. But if what you want, but it, what, if you want to find out now, what is the main distinction? It's the informal economy. Those that don't have access to a law that allows you to combine and that allows you to form capital, that is to say, that your goods can be used not only your lemons to squeeze juice out of them, but to hawk them, to give you credentials, to get you to bigger markets, to give you credibility, credibility to make you trustworthy. Those are the ones, forget that it's the proletariat or you're the boss. Some of the biggest bosses in the world in the informal economy, and they're not proletariat, they're the ones that have been the hardest hit. Forget that. Right. It's the informal economy, it's the rule of law. And now I, I want to bring in a little bit the, the Indian context, but before I do, I just want to remind our audience that if you do have questions for Mr. DeSoto, please don't hesitate to type them in the um, question box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and in a few minutes, we'll be building those to, to Mr. DeSoto. But first, I, I want to move on to um, talk about India's experience, where millions of informal workers um, live in, in India, many of whom lack land titles and, and cannot prove property ownership. Could you explain a little bit how the government, but also civil society, have sought to establish property rights in this context? And I'm thinking, for example, of the country's push to digitize land records or of programs like the one in Odisha State that aimed to give land titles to, um, I think it was hundreds of thousands of households in, in urban slums. Well, I, I really, I mean, I visited India, which is a country that I literally love. I mean, it's such a beautiful country, such a wonderful, uh, with such a wonderful culture. And I've had a look at a, a few uh, things. And um, the, idea, the idea is, uh, how, how can I explain it? I can, I mean, obviously, compared to anybody who's lived in India, who lives in India, knows the reality, I've got nothing to say. I'm just an outsider. But let me tell you what I saw as a proof. Uh, to indicate the importance of title. We don't even have to talk about land. I was invited by, I think it's the world's largest association which defends women's and enterprise. It's the moment just escaped because I wasn't expecting that particular angle. And they invited me. And uh, I remember it was 32 women leaders. It's an organization that's got wonderful people, about 2 million women entrepreneurs. And I had about 30 of the vice presidents there. And we sat down and I said, what have I gotten into? I have nothing for them. I mean, what do I know? But then I decided I had to perform to one degree or another. And uh, what they did was ask each of the women there, uh, uh, tell Mr. DeSoto, who, knows, who supposedly knows a lot about uh, the informal economy, what your problems are. And they kept on talking about issues regarding land and that they had to go back and forth so that they could do something about the estate and they had come to Delhi, but then the, they had to go back home and the train was expensive. I said, now, wait a second, this is really interesting. I have a question, uh, but it's intuitive. But as you get your older, intuition becomes very important. So I said, uh, how many of you ladies are uh, married? And I remember that all the hands went up with the exception of one. I said, all right, how many of you are married according to law? And then uh, there was only one. And then I said, all right, now let's go back to your property right. I understand that all your problems seem to come from the fact that somehow or other through marriage, you can come into your estate and you can come in and share. But if you're married just according to, like in Peru, the Catholic Church or local traditions, etc., those rights aren't born. And many of your problems come with the form of the fact you can't share into your husband's wealth or even the male families. Am I wrong or not? And I've never heard this before because I never lived in India, but all the women started going like, Ooh. they said, right on. All right. Here's what I'm saying. It's not only about titles to land. It's about titles to anything. If you are not inscribed and networked into a system of rights, which guarantees you access to the things you supposedly own, you don't really own them. 
You own them in the sense that a tiger, now we're talking about India, tigers, that a tiger dominates this territory or that an elephant dominates that kind of thing. But a property right is something different. It's not only about owning. It's about able to function in various levels. And if you're not married, it may be that the worst enemy of women in India could not be the question of having a man title, but just simply not having a good title about what the relationship to men are. That would apply. The yeah, law that, doesn't what... reach most people. So the devil, the devil is in the details. It's not just about land. The question is, do... Are you networked into the world of rights or are you not? And it starts off with a title, but it doesn't end there. No, that's a really interesting point, I think, to, to frame the title as a starting point, but then also, as you say, that the title is only good, any good, if you can exercise it or um, are kind of networked in, into that system that recognizes um, that kind of document. Now, we've talked Absolutely. a little bit about um, technology before, and, and of course, a number of, of countries, including India, um, have embarked on massive pushes to digitize land records, for example, to survey lands, monitor sales, tackle corruption. How successful have these types of initiatives been? And crucially, how can we ensure they're accessible to the marginalized communities who need them the most and who may not have access to these technologies? Well, the thing is, you know, di digitalization is a, a, is a wonderful thing, right? Uh, the, uh, uh, it, it should allow you to make an enormous amount of progress. For example, the informal economy in Peru now is becoming a very important political force. But the reason that one of the reasons they're doing that, they're being able to do that in this very rugged country, you know, we've got the Andes, which are very, you know, which break up the country in many parts, which by the way, as opposed to the Himalayas, are just as tall as the Himalayas, it depends if you're talking about sea level, then the Himalayas are taller. But if you're talking, but if you're talking from the apex of the earth, we're taller. But that breaks up the land and it divides up in various different parts. And all of a sudden we started finding out that informal people are getting together and becoming more powerful thanks to the social media. And that's a digitalization. Facebook of Peru's 32 million people, 30, uh, 24 million have Facebook accounts. And so you, they can keep in contact. There's no doubt that that works. The real, the real problem in many cases is that digitalization doesn't get, doesn't uh, separate you from other, uh, doesn't cure other problems. Like for example, the fact that Peru, the Peruvian central government produces, we've counted them, we're bean counters, produces 106 norms every day, every, every, every working day. That means 30,000 every year. And in those different laws are all the little devils and the details that allow you to really be able to use your rights well or not, whether the women can really access them or not, regardless of digitalization. So digitalization is something that allows people to communicate about things. But if you don't change the basic political structure whereby rights are awarded and, as you say, exercised, Digitalization just means you'll fail more rapidly rather than be rapidly more successful. So it doesn't stop you from changing your political agenda and finding ways to network with the rest of the country, because India is basically a continent. I mean, Jesus, 1,300 million, 200 million people, that, that's four times the population of Latin America. But it'll help you in a bunch of things, but the, four, the basic thing here is your property rights, your legal rights. And that, if you don't have them, whether you're digitalized or not, it's not going to work. So not in, 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 in and of itself. And I think it's interesting what you mentioned as well, that this technology can entail very simple forms of, of evidence or of proof, such as social media or kind of photographs that can be used to, to establish property claims. Um, now I have... Well, please, uh, if I, sorry, if I may yeah. add to that. It, obviously, Thanks. the digitalization is going is go, is going to help uh, enormously, and I'm sure it has all, all right. But we must just be clear that prop, that the financial sector is part of property rights. Don't leave that up only to bankers; they only yeah. know how to handle the liquid and monetary part. Sorry, I interrupted. No, no, no. That, that's an important distinction. I, I agree. Um, 
I have actually dozens of questions for you, but uh, I did promise to take some from the audience, so I'll, um, I'll move on to some of those. Um, the first one we have, you should touch on some of this actually at the start of our talk, but our first question is on what are the main challenges in establishing asset ownership in traditional economies? Literacy, social norms, lack of proof. Any thoughts on that? Well, I think, I think the, uh, the, the general idea is this, for what we've been able to see, wherever you go, it's hard to find a community uh, in, in the whole third world, in the whole developing world, where there aren't some type of records or another. As a matter of fact, in many parts, you know, records started in Lebanon, were the first ones, you know, that was over, I think it was about 2,000, 3,000 years before Jesus Christ. So records are, uh, are there. The thing is, of course, the records are born from essentially social contracts that are local. People have to agree among themselves. And when they've got to agree among themselves of who owns what, and you start setting up property records, the information about a property is enormous. Does it have trees? Does it have trees? How many people live on it? Is the, is the soil good? What are your water rights attached to it, etc.? All of these things. And a property right involves having to choose among all these descriptions of what's involved in ownership, just those that are more important to people. So the process of recording actually helps you understand what values are. And then you put them in written form. Written form, as uh, Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, would say, is what allows you to make commitments. Now... Mm you have to then do is be able to take all these written forms and if you want to be able to get into a larger economy not only the global economy just the expanded economy of getting to reach the neighbors so as to cooperate and be able to create that value added or that surplus value uh, it is necessary that your records all match and that what you say in one language like your passport you know i go to india with my peruvian passport and the indians recognize it immediately because we all follow Geneva Conventions, Vienna Conventions, and we've got standard things, right? If we want to say, you know, I'm one, if I, how tall am I? If I say, well, I'm Wagadu tall, you won't understand anything. But if I say I'm 179 centimeters, we will understand it because we've got a common language. So the biggest challenge also is to take all of these native and local stuff and be able to... Uh, uh, standardize them. Standards are crucial because otherwise we can't be able to understand each other. And then there's what happens is, is there's many people who, of course, because of the abuses of capitalism, capitalism has abused people. Socialism is too, by the way. I mean, there are guys called communists that held big dictatorships and killed a lot of people, just as much as capitalism did, have a tendency to say the way we're going to protect these local people is preserving their traditions and keeping them isolated because they have a right to their own identity. Very good. You have a right to your own identity, but then learn to live with your property, with your poverty, excuse me. So it's very simple. You've got to fight the intellectual battle that consists, how do you find an equilibrium between local identities and being part of humankind? And I'm really interested, before I go back to the audience questions, I'm really interested in what you mentioned about the recording process in itself. For, for those who may not be as familiar with, with how one goes about establishing land and property rights, how does that practically happen? Is it a case of using satellite imagery and data? Is it practical door-to-door -door knocking? Is it a combination of those things? How does the recording process actually take place? Oh, well, I think that there, the, if we talk about uh, recording, the, it's the digital world. It's a digital world in the first place, as, as, as I told you before, the majority of Peru is in the informal economy and that majority of Peru is the one that uses uh, digital technology because they have, once they had tele, you know, their local telephones uh, and in the digital world, they're able to connect now. So obviously to them, it's a lot more important than it is to people like me who have got landlines and other forms of communication. And there's no doubt that using you know, mapping and using satellites to do that is of an enormous advantage. There is absolutely no doubt. However, however, if you don't have the money to do it at the beginning, let the fact that you don't have the money to put up a satellite not be an obstacle to doing the recording. Why? Because in many developing countries, since uh, we don't have ways of settling disputes through law, 
and they have to be done by very traditional systems. Our difference, for example, from a property in California or a property in the United States, or even you know in Britain, uh, where one lawn flows into the other one, and sometimes you don't even see fences, right? In developing countries, there are walls. And when you photograph a city just by flying over it with a setna or whatever it is, you will be able to see the boundaries. And not only there, also in agriculture, you got trees and you've got rivers and you've got channels around it. So we already have maps just by photographing. In other words, digital technology is good. If the problem is how do you tender for it? How do you get it going? You don't have the money, take a picture. That can be digital, of course. Yeah. So I agree. I mean, the technology is good stuff. Now, that, that's a really good point. And I think you could say the same would be true of so many other technologies, that it's, um, you know, use or purpose in itself is extremely noble, but that depending on what you do with it, of course, um, it can, can have different outcomes. I want to move on to uh, another question from, from the audience, which I, I think is a really interesting one, and, and I know one you've worked on before, which is how do you define rights or ownership for tribal communities who have nurtured forest, forested areas and sustain their communities through this symbiotic relationship, but never owned, so to speak, the land that the forest is on. So I suppose, how do you guarantee you property rights for tribal property. lands? Ah, well, I think the, I, let me talk about Peru, so as to keep my enemies in one place. Mm -hmm. I go to communities, right? And since uh, capitalism came in, or even traditional system, you know, royalties and blue blood that came in and exploited people or had more rights than the other than, than other people uh, did. Um, the tribe was very important because the tribe and the community is what gives you your protection. It's what creates a social identity. So I understand all of that. But that is not about property rights. That's sovereignty. It's a different thing. When you go someplace, now you won't pick this up in the books because it's our own observation, but when you go to any place in the world, there's two ways to look at territory. One is sovereignty, which means these are the people who rule the area. And another thing is property, which is how do individuals divvy it up? So in Peru, when I go to community or even in the Middle East, it is very clear that this is the tribe of the Kadafa, or this is a Zulu tribe, or these are the Ashaninkas, no doubt about it. But then go inside, like I do in Peru, and I say, what a beautiful uh, little pig you have here. I like that motorcycle. What a great communal motorcycle that is. Hold it, they'll tell you. No, that motorcycle is not communal, it's mine. How about the house? Mine. How about that tree? Mine. So inside the sovereignty, there are local private property rights. The important mm -hmm. thing is that these be done in accordance with the community, which are the sovereigns, so that, uh, so that the uh, giving people property rights is not a pretext for other people to come and plunder and buy cheap. But these are two different things. So you can have the community rights and the tribal stuff, but I doubt that people live in houses that belong to just about everybody. And I doubt that people wear underwear that belongs to everybody or shirts that belong to everybody or have motorcycles that belong to everybody. So it's about time we learned the difference between a sovereign right, which is a political right, to which we're entitled to protect our local population because we are distinct and different from the neighbors with what we have a right to do as individuals or as families. Right. I think that's an important distinction. And that segs, uh, segues in nicely, actually, to um, another question I've just seen on the chat, which was, um, that access to land and ownership for tribal communities is, is a significant challenge across both developing and developed economies. And have any countries succeeded in including and networking these communities into their frameworks? Well, I would say that those who are the worst are the northern countries. You go to Canada and 3% of the population is indigenous. Mm. And they have none of the property rights that you want. And of course, this is not because people are discriminating them, because they remember that when white people came along, they wiped them out. And in the North America was General Custer and the Indian Wars, and they wiped them out. And before the whole continent belonged to them, and white men violated local treaties that they had signed with the Apaches, with the Navajos, 
uh, with the Sioux, with the Iroquois, all right? Now, therefore, here you have the Anglo-Saxons who have a guilt complex. And so they say, we will, don't want to bring in property rights because it's always a pretext to divvy people up and steal from them. All right, but they've gone to the point that therefore you have no real property rights over anything, but you can preserve those which were traditional. So what's traditional? Okay. Well, the typical things in India and Peru and the United States, moccasins, clothes, uh, jewelry, certain textiles, and entertainment. What is entertainment and art involved? Well, it involves, among other things, gambling. So that you get the people of North America, what they have is casinos run by mafias because he's the only ones who get go through the loophole of the law. So don't look for integration to the northern people because they don't integrate too well. You got to find out for yourself how you're going to do that. If you keep on looking at the northern people, there's not 3% of Amerindians. You don't have like the Canadians, 3% of Amerindians. You've got like Peruvians where Amerindians are 80% of the population and where Indians in India are 100% of the population. So don't look towards the North. They found a way of equalizing among whites. You've got to find a way of equalizing among other things without falling into their trap of Marx's left versus Adam Smith right. That's the Northern way. You've got to find your own solution. But that involves not getting into this thing about its tribes versus individuals. We're both parts of a tribe. I come from the Arequipa tribe of Peru. I'm proud of that, but I wouldn't want anybody once to own my house. And, I, and when I get a university degree, it's not the diverse university degree of the whole tribe. It's my university degree. You've got to learn to get the best you can from the West and the best you can from the communal experiences of the universe. And that, that's a really good point. As you mentioned, I mean, Canada and, and the U.S. as well, even in the past few months, time and again, um, kind of eroding those kind of tribal lands and, and reservation areas and and even France, where I'm personally from, um, itself, of course, has been responsible for, for centuries for the erosion of, of tribal and, and native lands. I want to go to um, one more question from the audience. I know we're, we're nearly out of time. Um, hopefully we can be forgiven for overrunning a, a few minutes given the technical glitches. Um, but the question I now have from the audience is, when do informal economies become too large to be managed and should there be a path to an informal economy becoming a formal structured sector? If so, when? I think when is when we forget about, when we stop saying that the problem is inclusion. Inclusion means that you're going to take somebody that is excluded and put them into a system. Now, the thing, what happens in most developing countries is that the system is lousy. It's a bad system. The proof of it, I mean, most of the people we put into jail in Peru lately with preventive laws are from the formal sector. The big crooks are from the formal sector. They're not from the informal economy. They have other systems of justice. What you want to do is find a way to integrate. You've got to take those traditions, Zoe, that you were talking about before and make sure that they can be brought into the social contract because the local, the local way things are enforced, obviously, is crucial to them having any global credibility. What do I care if you have an international driver's license? If I go back to your locality, I can't put you in jail for having, doing drunken driving or whatever it is. You've right. got to match. You find that Western countries in that sense are really very interesting. For example, the United States, as you can see through any film on gangsters, on whatever it is, love stories, et cetera, the police have different uniforms. And not only that, you don't have a monopoly of the police. They're local sheriffs, right? And then there's Steven Seagal, and then there's the federal forces, and there's the FBI. You make sure that through continual dissent and conflict and contrast, you make the local be combined with the global, and then it starts working. And so I think we're, you know, we're, we're going to find out in the developing world, most people law and order are local people. On the other hand, you need federal norms, and that means getting to the details and stop using British arguments, American and French arguments, because they respond to the local realities. There, there isn't a, uniform, a universal form, even in politics, and I end with this, Zoe, when you find out how the Americans elect a president, it's not going to be the popular election that's going to determine, it's electoral colleges, right? 
In Britain, right. it's not going to be the people that are going to determine. It's going to be your parliamentarians. And Switzerland's got seven presidents. In other words, you've got to find your own formula and stop trying to imitate the Western in terms of success. Think of their failures and how they overcame them. And you will see that it was a lot of needle and detailed work. And I think that's that's an excellent note to, to end on. Fernando, thank you so much. I have um, the organizers telling me that we, we must move on to our next session. Of course, we are the fifth, I believe, of a 24-hour event, so still much to come. Um, but thank you so much for, for your time. Um, I could really speak to, to you for hours, and, and I hope our audience have enjoyed this as well. Um, if you haven't had a chance to ask your question yet, please do get in touch on Twitter or with the Nudge team.